the Mike Illich School of Business Executive Speaker Series, the Dean's Executive Speaker Series. At, and we're excited very much today to have Roz Brewer and Pamela Moore will introduce her in just a minute. But we definitely want to welcome to all you Cast Tech students, Cast Tech in the house. And we are looking forward to hearing about the wonderful tra trajectory of her career from Cast Tech to the top of Walgreens. So without further ado, Pamela Moore. Thank you, Carol. I'd like to thank Assistant Dean Rupert Jones and Dean Forsyth of the Mike Illich School of Business at Wayne State University, my alma mater. Thank you, Kate and Tony from the Walgreens team. And thank you, Rob from Illich Holdings. Thank you to everyone from Wayne State who helped put this together today. Um, so this is a dream for me to be able to moderate this conversation with our very own Roz Brewer. I want to welcome all of the students at Detroit Public Schools Community District, all of the students and the educators. This was a snow day for us today, but students had to sign on virtually. I'd like to welcome all of the students, alumni, faculty, and staff at Wayne State University, the greater Detroit business community, local viewers, and those of you that are viewing across the country, welcome. But I do have to give the special shout out to Cass Technical High School, where Roz Brewer and I, oh, ran up and down the hallways at a time when our security, our fierce security team, uh, was made up of two individuals called Bonnie and Clyde. So just a little Cass Tech trivia for those of you that were there. So welcome, welcome to all of you. We're in the middle of a snowstorm here in Detroit, but it's okay. The only thing that would be better would be for me to be sitting in the same room with Rosalind Brewer. But let me tell you a little bit about Miss Brewer's stellar career. She is a Detroit native. She is a Cass Tech alumna. She joined Walgreens Boots Alliance as Chief Executive Officer in March 2021. She is also a director on the board. From 2017 to 2021, she served as Chief Operating Officer and Group President at Starbucks. Prior to Starbucks, from 2012 to 2017, she served as President and Chief Executive Officer of Sam's Club, a membership-only retail warehouse club and division of Walmart, Inc. She previously held several executive leadership positions with Walmart beginning in 2006. After graduation from Spelman in 1984, she joined Kimberly Clark, a global health and hygiene products company and climbed the ladder for 22 years, ending as president of Global Non-Wovens Division from 2004 to 26. Ms. Brewer currently serves as the chair of the Board of Trustees for Spelman College, where she did her undergraduate work. She also is a board member of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture and formerly served on the boards of Starbucks, Amazon, Lockheed Martin Corporation, and Molson Coors Brewing Company. She is currently ranked number six on Fortune's 50 most powerful women in business. Please help me welcome Miss Rosalind Brewer. Hello, Miss Brewer. Hello, Hello. Pam. How are you? I am wonderful. How are you? Fantastic. It's great to be on screen with you. So, and, and listen to this introduction that doesn't sound like me, but it is. Well, we're going to, we're going to get into that. We're going to get into that. So let me frame the conversation for those that are listening today. Of course, we're going to go down memory lane with you. We're going to talk about your whole journey uh, starting in Detroit. Um, but also we're going to talk about what businesses expect from today's high school and college students upon hiring and how our institutions of learning can best prepare our young people for those needed skills and tools as they go into the workforce. Also, happy Black History Month, Roz. Yes. Uh, it is day two of Black History Month. And so we're also gonna, gonna touch upon some things surrounding uh, equity and inclusion and race today. So can we get started? Absolutely. Okay, thank you so much for joining us. So you've been a lot of firsts, and I've heard you say that you'll be glad when the conversation doesn't have to start with that. Right. But when you became CEO of Walgreens Boots Alliance in March of 2021, 
one, we were in the middle of a pandemic and you were the only black female leading a Fortune 500 company. Now we do have two. But Walgreens, 133 million in sales, 13,000 locations, 315,000 employees across nine countries. Wow. Uh, what does this experience feel like for you? You know, it feels like, um, you know, the culmination of a journey, uh, Pam. It is, uh, I look back on all of my experiences and um, glad for all of them because in this particular role, I'm having to bring everything to bear um, in this particular moment, in this particular um, business environment. So um, it feels like a certain sense of being prepared but also a sense of um, responsibility to help solve a lot of things that are happening right now in our environment. And we'll get into a little bit of that later. So let's go back. I think we have a, a picture. Uh, we're gonna go oh, no. all the way back. Yeah, we do. We have Ugh. a picture. We're gonna, oh, there are all the pictures. <laughs> so that's, that's Cast Tech in the middle. I think that's Spellman on the right. Yes. It's, uh, beautiful, yes. beautiful. So you and four siblings grew up in Detroit. Mm -hmm. Your parents worked for one of the big three. You may have to be from these parts to know what the big three is. Yes. Um, and they did not attend college. However, education was a big focal point in your home. And you attended Bagley and Cass Tech. I think your major was Kim Bio at Cass. That's right. And uh, your father now deceased and my condolences. I know you were very close to him and he never missed one of your events, and he worked three jobs. Yes. In your mind, did you come from humble beginnings? And, and just give us a little insight to what your goals and dreams were when you were at Detroit Public Schools. Sure, so, you know, for me, Detroit Public Schools, it was everything. I mean, I went to Bagley Elementary, um, then I went to Hampton Junior High, and then to Cass Tech. And, you know, the education I received, I felt was second to none. Um, I was amongst um, a very uh, diverse environment, but a very challenging one. Mm -hmm. um, this is a, at a time when, you know, teachers were given every resource, uh, you know, that they could be given um, for us as students. And I remember being able to take my music lessons, you know, as part of, you know, coming to school every day and my art classes and, you know, all of those things. And so it was everything for me. Um, it actually made me uh, love uh, learning because I don't recall a time where I was in a situation where I wasn't enjoying it. You know, it was, it was fantastic. And um, I, as I look back on it, I felt like I was probably in a, you know, private school setting because the resources were so strong. The resources were plentiful, and that is no longer the case for public schools in urban districts ac across the country and Detroit in particular. Um, so I want to stay with that well-rounded. We always call that a well-rounded education yes. uh, at the district now. And um, how important was that? Because I know you were interested in math and science and you wanted to be a physician, but then you took piano lessons, you played the violin as as I did as well. And we just had everything. Um, and so how important is that along with the academics that children are exposed to the extracurricular activities and the music and the art and the physical education? How important is that? I think it's absolutely imperative. It's extremely important because it allows that child to explore themselves, right? And so we all start off with our wants and likes and wishes, but it's your environment that shapes you and the exposure. I mean, I, I never came home and said, mom, can I play the violin? Can I play the piano? I remember after taking one of the standardized exams, someone coming to the classroom saying, you know, can I see Rosalind Gates at the time was my maiden name. And I'd stepped out of the classroom and they said, well, we want you to go down the hall. Let's see how, you know, good at you, you know, you could become at, you know, uh, music lessons. And so I was selected, you know, and so there was at that time research being done on the correlation between math and music. And so you felt like somebody was paying attention to you. 
and you felt like somebody was doing the work. I'm like, how do they know that? I mean, I, I would have never thought, right? And so that's how I began to play the violin was that in elementary school, I was selected to play and brought into it. And um, it was it was fascinating for me. Um, and it, it started um, a feeling for me of uh, self-confidence um, at a very early age because somebody was watching. And it was also at a time, uh, Pam, when, you know, you know, both my parents worked. And when you came to school, the teachers knew you. I mean, I knew, I can still remember, you know, Dr. Enos Stafford, who was the principal at Bagley Elementary. I remember the name of my kindergarten teacher. You know, I still keep in touch with her daughter to this day. And, um, and so it's, you know, it's really interesting to see how personal it was for me coming through Detroit public schools. I felt uh, very much counted on. And, you know, it's interesting, even all the way through to high school at Cass Tech, the reason why I ended up at Spelman College was because my guidance counselor was Dr. Geneva Carter, and she talked me into going to Spelman College, which I had never heard of Spelman before. And we didn't have the internet, and she showed me this catalog, and I saw these green trees and hot weather, <laughs> and I was sold, right? And she was like the coolest teacher ever. So I wanted to be Dr. Geneva Carter. I didn't know what she did, what she studied, but I wanted to be her. So I was going to her college, you know, and um, that's how I got interested in Spelman College. Yeah, teachers were such a big influence uh, and they still are, yes. of course, but, but same experience for me. They asked me, so what instruments would you like to play? I said, oh, well, the violin and oh, the harp. They gave me a violin and a harp and I played it. Yeah. Um, so public school is critical and uh, the resources to these public school systems. And we've got to figure out how to do a, a different way of funding because we're just not getting the resources to our young people these days. So I, I love these stories about Cast Tech teachers and, and counselors and, and their influence. But a lot of this was who little Rosalind Gates was, right? Who do you credit for the work ethic that you have and probably have always had? Yeah. Yeah. I have to say my parents, um, all we ever knew was hard work ethic, you know, to see my dad shuffle through three jobs at one time. And, you know, when I was uh, three to three and a half years old, um, my mom went back into the workplace and, you know, took a position with one of the big three. And um, I was the youngest of five. And so I was a latchkey child at three and a half years old because my older siblings would, you know, there was this transition of when she left for work, she worked the afternoon shift and when the older siblings came home from school. So I would just, you know, get propped in the windowsill and all the neighbors would watch me sitting in the windowsill for 45 minutes until the rest of the kids came home and took care of me. Um, but, you know, it was, you know, that neighborhood village, um, right. you know, and just watching, you know, those people were getting off the bus, coming home from work, looking at me in the window. So all I ever saw were people moving people doing very positive things, people working hard, people being very deliberate at working, right? And um, being engaged with what they did for a living. And my parents were absolutely, um, you know, part of that. And my mom taking public transportation to get to work every day. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just like we're seeing the snowstorm there, my mom would walk three blocks down to, you know, create the, you know, the, the ride to work and she'd jump on public system and, go to work every day and um, and come home in that snow. And so that's all, you know, you work before you go to work in that's Detroit. Right. You know, so that's, right. that's, that's right. the way it is. That's right. Well, let's talk about um, after you graduated from Cass Tech and that counselor, because you had your eyes on another school. And I that did. counselor said, no, let me tell you about Spelman. So you ended up at prestigious, historically black Spelman College in Atlanta. And you majored in chemistry. So you saw the picture and you saw the warm weather, but what was it that she said that really made you choose Spelman? And did you know about HBCUs at the time? Yeah, no, I did not know about HBCUs um, because actually my, um, one of my older sisters, so my older siblings were in college um, at the time, but they went to my one, I have one sister at Wayne State. I had um, a brother at GM Institute. 
And so, um, you know, they were spread out over the colleges across Michigan. So, we, you know, I didn't know about these. They helped me apply to, to Spelman and actually do the, go through the process. But, you know, what Dr. Geneva Carter talked to me about was Spelman was, you know, she did let me know that it was a black institution, but it was all women's school. And I thought, ooh, this could be interesting um, because in sixth grade at Bagley Elementary, there was this test done of separating us between an all boy class and an all girl class. Mm -hmm. And I loved it. And so I thought the idea to go to a single sex institution, I was like, I'm in, you know, this is going to be fun. You know, I had a lot of girlfriends in, um, at CAS um, and a little story there just this past Saturday. We were on a Zoom call for two and a half hours cutting up. You know, um, I'm still very close to them. Uh, we're going on a vacation this summer uh, together. And so, um, you know, Dr. Carter was right. You know, those will be lasting relationships when you go to Spelman College. You'll be in another place where people will care about you and look you in the face and they will look like you. And she helped me understand that that is very, very important. And just her, everything about her, um, I just wanted to be her. So whatever she, you know, I just believed in her. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted, you know, to emulate what, you know, it's like if she's become like this, I, that's what I want. Yeah. So were those still formative years when you got to Spelman or in your mind, did you know that Rosalind Brewer wanted to be a chemist or be a CEO or? No, no. I went to Spelman and I did, I had all the fun that you're, you know, you should have in college. You know, I pledged a sorority. Um, we had, you know, uh, tons of fun on campus. Uh, but the other thing that did come stay with me was a sense of service. So mm -hmm. I worked in the community. Spelman College is um, on the side of town that's housed between, um, it's just southwest of downtown. So there's, um, you know, uh, public housing um, outside the gates of the college. And so I did a lot of vol volunteering and that started back in some things I had done in Detroit. And um, I continued that when I got to Spelman. And so I think I had a sense of service. Um, and I really feel like when I was there, it was so much not about me. It was about what I wanted to do. I mean, Atlanta had so much that you could do to get involved in to help that city that I was all in, you know, so I don't think I was thinking much about myself so much. I was thinking about what I wanted to do. I mean, we, it was, it was everything. We would all leave the campus in afternoons and Saturday mornings going to do something, clean up or do something. And that was fun. That was part of our social life. So um, it was a sense of service. I actually didn't get serious about what I wanted to do until about my junior year. I mean, at that point, um, my father had been diagnosed with cancer. I knew that I couldn't depend on my parents. Um, my dad passed away six weeks before graduation and I knew I had to get, you know, get a plan. Right. And so I was going to go to graduate school to extend things, but the financials weren't there. Mm -hmm. So I jumped out and started working and, um, I just went to work because all I had seen was work. I didn't think anything else. So you took a job at Kimberly Clark. And where you stayed for 22 years yes. <laughs> and, and rose up the ladder. Mm -hmm. um, what did you learn, though, from your not only from your education, but also your practical work experience that allowed you to ascend to senior leadership positions within Kimberly Clark? Yeah. So, you know, one interesting thing for me is my summer before I came to college. So I graduated from CAS. That summer, I had a chance to work because of my chem bio major. I worked for Warner Lambert Pharmaceuticals in downtown Detroit, east of Detroit, uh, downtown. And I worked in their chemistry lab. And I really enjoyed it. I mean, it was great. We were just testing vitamin products for dissolution and things like that and um, shelf life. And it was just fun. You know, we, um, I had a summer job. And so I, you know, I, been majoring in chemistry and biology. I just did it again at Spelman and chose chemistry. But now I never really actually wanted to be a chemist because mm. I actually thought it was sort of isolating and a little boring. But, um, but you know, some parts of it were interesting. So I, I just kept going. I think I was just on um, gerbil wheel of, you know, make money, you know, take care of yourself, be independent. There's nothing to fall back on. That I did feel. I did feel a large sense of it's on me. Mm. And um, that really propelled me to do my very best because I didn't feel as if I had 
um, a ton to fall back on. You know, it was clear at that point that I was on my own. So one of the questions that came in from a Wayne State alum said, how do you know when it's time to move on to another opportunity or a promotion? How do you know? Yes, that's a very good question. You know, I stayed at Kimberly Clark for a long time. Uh, Kimberly Clark raised and groomed me. Um, I had both of my children while I was an employee there. They embraced me, um, you know, as, as a mom. I feel like I raised my kids there too. Um, and um, I loved it. Um, I loved Kimberly Clark because I knew I had been there for a good period of time. I did not want to retire from there. And at that point, I actually was hitting the ceiling, right? And so um, I had made it to group president. Um, and again, that was when I was one of the first, I was the first vice president, a uh, black female uh, vice president they had ever had and, and then moved to, to president. So, you know, I just, and, and at some point that runs out, right? And so I knew I wanted to do something different. So um, a recruiter contacted me about an opportunity at Walmart and I never thought I really wanted to join Walmart. Um, they weren't having the best of times from a diversity standpoint. And I kept telling them, I'm not interested. I'm not your token, you know, but they kept coming back for about six months. And, um, and I decided that, you know, maybe it is time to move, but I took a step down. I went from group president all the way back to vice president. And, um, it was, uh, it was, it was a big shift because I was learning retail, but I was very glad I did it. I learned so much, um, and I caught up later, but it, it, uh, it was a big decision. So let's talk about the C-suite. Uh, you, you leave there, you go to Walmart, you go to Sam's club, uh, your COO at Starbucks. And here we are 40 years later, still challenging affirmative action. And now we're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. We don't have enough diversity. We don't have enough equity. We need more inclusion. I want to talk a little bit about the 2018 incident at Starbucks. Uh, that many viewing may remember. Two black men were arrested at a Philadelphia Starbucks. Um, it went viral on black social media and you jumped right in. You yeah. claimed it, you took charge of it, you claimed accountability. Just share a little bit about that incident from your perspective and why it hit so close to home for you. Sure. So, you know, I had just been with a company for less than six months and um, I was, you know, operating the company for the most part. And um, when this incident happened um, and I got the initial um, alert that it was going on, because I would get alerts, you know, if something happened in one of the stores and you read it and say, OK, OK. And then this one was kind of like two men arrested. I said, oh, OK, sometimes that happens. And then because of black social media, um, I saw two black men. Now, for many of the people in the company, they just kept going. This was uh, getting late in the week. It was a Thursday evening. And um, so, but two black men, I was like, mm, okay, radar went off. Um, so I uh, was traveling. I got off the train and uh, made a phone call. I was like, you know, what's going on? And they were like, this is, I think this is revving up. And I started looking at social media. I was like, oh, it's hot. It's, it's, this is hot. Um, and so, uh, we uh, we we started to gather, but um, probably not fast enough. So I turned around and went back from the West Coast and uh, landed in Philadelphia um, overnight um, with with the bags that I had with me um, and began to dig in and see what was going on. Eventually, uh, we all kind of colluded and you know got together in Philadelphia and, and got in a war room and started working the situation. I knew it was going to be bad. My biggest fear was just looking at the two men as I was looking at what was popping on sh social media. I knew right then and there, I was like, man, those those two gentlemen look look too familiar to me. Right. They look like my 24 year old son and uh, exactly like him. And um, my heart sank. And I was like, they're going, you know, and they were carting them off to jail because two officers came in off of bicycles. They called for reinforcement Four came, then another two. So eight officers on two 24 year old black men that that stack in the cards. Right. And yeah. so um, I knew um, I had to get involved. I got very, uh, very emotionally attached to this situation, knew that there's something that had failed in our operations to even allow this to happen at a Starbucks. I would have never imagined that this would happen at a Starbucks. 
And so I got, I dug in and, you know, I also got the calls from my son and all of his friends, all the kids that I had been around my house, you know, growing up was like, Miss Brewer, what, what's going on? Don't you work at Starbucks? What's happening? So I knew I had a sense of responsibility, but it was very emotional and personal because I looked those two guys in the face and knew, yeah. you know, this is wrong. So was it a culture shift at Starbucks after you brought everyone into the war room and did that training? Was, was yeah, that you know, it was a culture shift. Um, you know, one thing I will have to compliment Starbucks on is that they were they were close enough to this issue to know that it wasn't it wasn't right. Right. And so no one had to explain much to them that this is wrong. But what we realized is that our practices has, hadn't caught up with us, right? So we had a young white woman um, running a store in Spruce and 18th in Philadelphia. You know, probably not a good idea, right? And so, um, and also too, we noticed that, you know, we didn't update our measures in terms of how do we manage, you know, uh, people sitting in the store maybe too long, you know, and, and so that happens now, you know, there's a mm -hmm. lot of folks that sit around in public settings, libraries and all, but our practices had not been updated. So shame on us. We took advantage of that to update our practices. And then we realized that we had not done enough training on, you know, unconscious bias. And so what happens when someone looks different than you and you take an aggressive position because of lack of familiarity or whatever, and uh, we address that. And we addressed it very aggressively. And I would tell you that it made the company much better um, off as a company. Uh, we learned from it and um, we did the right thing by those two gentlemen. And so for the job seekers uh, currently at Wayne State or, or in high school that have tuned in, how important is the culture of an organization? And is it as important as compensation? Yeah, so let me let me talk about that because that's something that um, you know I am uh, working on at at WBA at Walgreens. You know, I happen to have a strong view that culture will trump any success or a strategic plan you could ever create. Um, if you get um, you know a good, positive, strong culture, um, people will perform and the company will excel because people want to be there and they feel um, valued, you know, someone's talking to them, seeing them, hearing them, and they feel right, whatever that means to you. If you feel right when you come to work every day, um, you're gonna enjoy coming to work and you're gonna, you're gonna do more and better. And, um, and so I've always tried to create those kinds of environments, either if I was leading a, a small, medium or large team or, or running the company. Um, that's really important to me because I remember times in my career where it just didn't feel right. And that's one of those things to your prior question, when was it time to leave? When it didn't feel right anymore, right? And you know when, when that is, you know, when someone looks at you and say, you know, like on one of my performance reviews, you know what, you, you, you think you're smarter than, you know, you really are, right? And so, um, you know, and, and, you know, I get, I have gotten those comments, right? And, um, you know, you can you can't not be smart and do some of this hard work. I mean, you just That's can't, right? right? That's you know? right. That's um, right. Especially when you're following all the rules otherwise. And so, um, you know, I'm not breaking rules. I'm doing the work. And right. uh, there's some brain matter in that. So, you know, you know when it's when it's not the uh, the right time. So, you know, one one thing I'm telling people that I'm mentoring right now about opportunities and getting in the space where you excel you know, you really must follow your passions. It makes so much different when you're passionate about the work that you do and it's and, and the creativity that you can bring. Sometimes even if you think it's the career path that won't render, um, you know, great rewards financially, believe you me, you can turn that around and it becomes um, something you never imagined if you're really extremely passionate about it. And so I tell people, you know, even if they're, you know, writers, artists, you know, if you're passionate about it, your your day will come. And that day may look a little bit different, but it's a day where you feel very good about getting up every day and very good about doing that 10th or 11th assignment, you know, at the end of the day, you know, and um, and, and, and that's that's when it really works for you. That's very, very true. Uh, so you, you're a walking example of diversity, equity and inclusion. Um, and we all want to see ourselves when we walk into a room, but you've walked into a lot of rooms and didn't see yourself. 
Right. And it's important. And I want you to talk about why it's important. But I've also heard you talk about bringing your whole self, bringing the whole person to work. Yes. So just talk about that for a moment. Yeah. Why is that important in this environment that we're in? Absolutely. Yeah. There, you know, many, many, many times I've walked in rooms and there was there was nothing like me in the room. And you had to explain and you had to explain why you were in the room. Yeah. Yeah. I know exactly. that one too. Yeah, exactly. And so um, even personality wise, you know, just, you know, just give me somebody who even gets it or gets me. Right. Um, but, you know, I will tell you in that respect that um, when I, you know, searched for so long to see someone like myself and I never did, I just reckoned with myself that I just had to bring my whole self to work every day. Um, give it up. Don't try and assimilate to anything other than myself. It was way too stressful. And then the second thing is I had to just mentor like mad to get other people to come up behind me because I said, I am not doing this by myself. Right. Because also to think about walking in rooms that don't look like you. But think about leading teams that don't look like you. Mm. That's really hard because, you know, you when you work for somebody, you want to get to know them and feel them. So think about it on the other side. It was very hard to get to motivate others when I'm different than the people who work for me. So the wonderful thing is that, you know, I got the opportunity to hire. And um, and that's what I really enjoyed about moving up in my career was that I had the ability to make change happen. And I said, if I'm going to be here and make these sacrifices and work this hard, I'm going to make change happen at the same time. So I've been very deliberate about that. Um, and uh, sometimes, you know, uh, not always uh, welcomed, but um, you do it. And that's what I mean about following your passions. I felt good when I went home every day because I was doing the right thing and I knew I was doing the right thing. And I knew if I didn't do it, there weren't going to be very many other people doing it. So I want to talk about your network. This question came from a Cast Tech alum. How did you begin to grow your professional network when you were the only one in the room? And then how did you find mentors? Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting. Um, I did have some breakthroughs early on in my career. Most of my mentors were white males. Mm. And um, I think um, some of, you know, my white male leaders would look at me and I don't know if they felt sorry for me or what, or they saw potential. And um, good leaders seek potential in others, and they don't let race or gender stop them. And so I had good leaders around me that white males who said, you know, I need good talent. And um, they took me under their wings. So for a very long time, all of my mentors were white males. And then when more women came into the workforce and my mentors were white females, and then later on they became black females and black males. And so um, I began to grow from um, people who looked like me, but I had to seek them out. Um, you know, if I saw someone getting a promotion or something, I try and at that time I have to show my age, write a letter. Right. You know, right. Um, you know, I can't text anybody back then. But, you know, you had to reach out and then joining certain organizations, too, but also being very deliberate with follow up. Um, you know, you have to follow through on building relationships. Um, and uh, that's very important. And, and not just seeking people out when you need them. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that leaders really don't enjoy. You know, when you get that little, can you help me get my promotion? I'm like, well, what do you do for a living? I mean, I can't help you get a promotion. I don't control wherever you work. Right. But, you know, it's about relationships and leaving good, um, you know, good performance behind. And after a while, once you start performing, people reach out to you. That's true. Uh, talk about right now. So we're going to kind of shift to um, the, the, you know, the work environment and what employers are looking for and what job mm -hmm. seekers should be thinking about. Um, so during this pandemic, have you had to shift on how you are recruiting talent, what you're looking for right now, how you're hiring, training, retaining talent? Has yeah. that changed just because we're in the middle of a pandemic still? This is the most complicated time uh, to try and uh, motivate, engage, inspire your, your teams. Um, I am spending a um, really disproportionate amount of my time just um, engaging with my teams. And um, it's deliberate. You know, every Friday I try to take a light schedule. So but I get up in the morning and I just start calling people. Right. You know, like, how was your week? You know, blah, blah, blah. Follow up. And I, you know, look back over my week on notes and just touch people as best I can. 
um, doing all the deliberate things of doing, um, you know, video calls, having, you know, a, a, a meal on, on video together with, with my partners when we can't be in the same place. Um, and then just being very deliberate, um, you know, hiring is, is very difficult right now. Um, you know, certain levels, I do not want to hire without being across the table from somebody. So mm. I've been masking up and flying and getting in front of people because, you know, I have, um, I'm building um, pretty much a new team at WBA. Um, and um, we've got a lot of good development going on, a lot of good promotions going on, but we're hiring also from the outside. And that's difficult. Um, in terms of getting them on board and making sure that they feel like, again, this culture piece is really important. I want them to feel the culture before they understand the business, right? Because right. they, they, I want to make sure that they feel like they can fit in, right? And so that's a mutual thing. So I'm spending a lot of time trying to touch and feel people as best I can. So it's it's pretty difficult. And people are deciding, making decisions differently, right? I, I could sometimes put a big salary number in front of a few people and get their attention. Um, it's not working these days. I mean, you got to put something more in front of them. They want to see a sense of purpose in the company. They want to see that, you know, I'm engaged, that I'm authentic, that I'm willing to roll up my sleeves and do some of the simplest of jobs. I mean, I think people get excited to know that I visit my stores frequently. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and I think it's, it's taking a lot more out of leaders to create great teams. I believe that. Um... So we've heard jobs classified since the pandemic as essential jobs, and essential workers that have to show up. And then those of us that can work remotely, what's Walgreens stance on that? I think I've heard you say that, you know, being a hundred percent remote, you just become detached and yeah. you don't feel the culture. Yeah. I don't support a hundred percent remote uh, at all because, um, you know, I, we are human beings and um, we are born to relate to each other. Um, and there's nothing we can do to change the habits of people. When you see someone um, more frequently in that, in how you get familiar with them and how you get to know them in a way that you can count on them, that usually happens in, you know, face-to-face, -face, hand to hand combat. You know, I hate to say it, that's just the way it is. And um, you know, I want to, you know, fight the same issues with everybody else in the same room. And you can't, it's tough to do that via video. And, um, you know, I open up the camera sometimes and I can look in someone's face until it's not a good day. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I try and say what's, what's going on. And, you know, we do this, you know, this mood screen, like, you know, how are you feeling today on a scale of one to 10, red or blue? And, uh, you know, people are, are dying for affection and, and to be heard and listened to. And I, so I don't think, so really what we're doing, uh, we're doing a hybrid at, at Walgreens. And by that, I mean, you know, even if, you know, some of our systems engineers can absolutely do their work remotely, but what we're asking is that once a week, um, month or quarter, you've got to have a touchy feely meeting, a, a staff meeting, you have to come into the office. And so um, we're, we're asking for people to do that because we think it's best for everyone. Sure. So to the young people listening again, I'm going to go back to them. Did your teachers or anyone along the way tell you, you know, as a young black woman, you can be a CEO, you can be a physician, you can be a scientist? Um, because I, don't, I still think we don't have those images for our young people of color. Um, and you and I know they should be reaching for the stars. But if you don't yes. see yourself in those roles and images, how can we how can we change that? Of course, we're doing that right now. I think there are yes. about 100 yeah. people on the line. And so I wanted everybody to know yeah. who Austin Brewer is. But how do we how do we change that? You know, I think exposure is like uh, the most important thing. You know, I really want, you know, like my two children, you know, we really um, encourage, you know, to be studious and all of those things, but we also did a lot to expose them. Mm -hmm. You know, if it was no more than, you know, taking them, you know, we always, I've lived away from Detroit in a very long time. My children, you, you will ask them, their very favorite place to go is Detroit. Um, you know, and so connecting them with family, um, heritage, um, the things, you know, sometimes you don't have to show a child a position or a title. You have to show them love. You have to show them um, encouragement. You have to show them that they count and that they matter and that you're going to spend the time with them, quality time, 
And then from that comes their engagement and their interest. And so um, I didn't really spend a lot of time with my own kids saying, look at this doctor over here. Um, we talked more about values and, and what it meant to do the right thing um, and worked on their self-confidence. And I think that's something that we also need to do is just looking at those very important basics so that they make the best decisions for themselves. And then, um, you know, then we leave it to, you know, then putting them in front of, you know, success factors and successful people. So we're winding down, got a few minutes left. Um, I want to talk about mental health. This yeah. pandemic has made us focused on mental health. In particular, this week, a young yes. lady took her life in New York. Um, it's robbed us. I think it's robbed our young people coming from school, all those memories that you and I had, prom, oh, yeah. homecoming, swing out. People don't know what swing out is. unless Oh, I do. Uh, yeah, I know you and I do. <laughs> yeah. um, but it's robbed us of so much social engagements, um, yeah. taking loved ones away. Um, give some advice to young people right now yeah. who are going through a time that none of us have ever gone through. How do they stay focused? How do they stay on, yeah. on, on that path, keeping their eyes on the prize, no matter what, like young Rosalind Gates did? Yeah. How, how do they do that right now? Yeah, you know, Pam, and that's why I stress um, that I don't believe in 100% remote work because you this we're seeing that those who are 100% remote have more issues with anxiety and depression. Um, the numbers are out there. Um, and so what I would suggest to um, you know young people today is please try and um, measure the amount of social media that you take in. Mm -hmm. I personally have to do that myself because I am a news junkie. And I find myself now reading the Washington Post through Instagram. And I'm like, Roz, why are you doing that? Just go get a newspaper or, you know, read it online. But why are you going through social media? Because then I get attracted to other things and I end up staying up too late. And I like Instagram, I have to say, you know, but you know what? It, 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 it bothers me. You know, it, um, you know, I feel like it's connecting me, but it's also training me to look at things that I wouldn't normally read that aren't always positive. So I understand this, you know, I have an 18 year old and um, pull away from it um, a little bit. Don't leave it alone because there's some wonderful things about it, but pull away, um, spend time with your family. If you cannot get, you know, away from, you know, if you can't social, uh, social distance effectively, find those moments, go outside, um, but really seek to be with other people as best you can right now. The other thing that um, I think we need to do is to make sure that we call people. You know, I'm finding that my 18 year old doesn't like to talk to people face to face. She prefers texting or calling. I'm working on her with that. You know, you got to stand up, look somebody in the eye and tell them what you want. Um, and I'm, I really encourage young people to kind of put that down and see if you can have a face to face conversation. It's hard. I, I mean, I, and I, I keep saying I put myself in that because I find myself I'm sitting here right now. I've got two phones, right? I, I can't get around it, but you know, I have to be intentional. So I'm just asking young people, if I'm being deliberate uh, to do that, please, um, you know, try to engage in something else that interests you and put it away and pick it back up um, at, at uh, important times um, and really focus on your mental health. The other thing I would say is that do not be ashamed to talk about it when you're not feeling your best. Um, you know, this little fun thing of doing, are you red or blue today? Um, you know, we chuckle about it, but, you know, we now are having some frank conversation. I'm feeling blue because, you know, I saw this young lady, what happened to her over the weekend. And so we talk about that. So I want people to feel very comfortable seeking help for, um, anxiety and depression. It is common and talk. Yes. Talk and this is common and you are not in this by yourself. There's, you know, seek the resources, please. Right. Um, I'm really big on this issue around mental health because the isolation, we were not bred as a human to not interact with other people. That's just That's not right. the way it's in us. That's so right. I just hope these, you know, that this, you know, the students at Cast Tech, you know, you got a lot ahead of you. You, you will be amazed how well developed you are. I just talk about Cast Tech all the time. Um, uh, you are ready, um, you're prepared, and um, I'm counting on you, you know. Yes. I I'm counting on them as well. So we are 
at 346. My last question is some of us of a certain age, Roz Brewer, are thinking about retirement. You are at the top of your game. <laughs> What is next? And does retirement cross your mind? And I'm going to end with that question. No, you know what? I, I won't ever retire. I'll be doing something. I'll be buzzing around until I can't buzz anymore. You know, I don't know what it, what it is. I really wouldn't mind teaching at some point. You know, um, um, I'm not the best disciplinarian. We'll probably be hanging out in the classroom as well as chit-chatting. And then we'll get to an exam every now and then because I'm a chatty Cathy. But the, um, you know, I really might end up back in the classroom one day. That would be amazing. So uh, I cannot thank you enough. Um, I want to quote Malcolm X. He said that education is our passport to the future for tomorrow belongs to the people who prepare for it today. You are living proof of that. I started speaking your name out loud about a year ago. I thought, you know, our students need to know who Rosalind Brewer is. And so I say to the young people listening, speak it into existence. Um, look what manifested. I am here with Rosalind Brewer today and passion, when passion and skills and interests all come together and intersect, it's magical. It's and this was magical for me today, Ms. Brewer. Thank you. We know that your time is precious, but on behalf of everyone that's listening today, we are so proud. Detroit is so proud. Thank Detroit you. Public Schools Community District is so proud. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart for spending time with us today. Well, thank you. I enjoyed every minute of it. Wish we could be together. Same here. Well, okay. So next time. Next and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand it back over to Carol Hill. Thank you so much. Uh, Pamela Moore. She's a double alum of the Mike Illich School of Business, where she received her bachelor's and her MBA. Um, and she is currently the Detroit Public Schools Foundation president. We thank her for moderating this informative and inspirational discussion with Roz Brewer. Wherever you are in your academic or professional career, I hope all of our guests today have learned something that will help you as you continue your journey. For those of you who requested information on Illich School, when you registered, we will be hosting several virtual information sessions in the coming weeks. We will email you the details of those events within the next day or so. And remember, you can always connect with us at illichbusiness.wayne.edu. Thank you for coming today.